In this video, I'm going to uncover how authoritarian regimes employ online trolls domestically and internationally. Then I'll offer you one simple trick on how to spot them and deal with them. Three point five per cent. That's all you need. 3.5% of the population actively participating in protest to ensure serious political change. That was the conclusion of a Harvard political scientist who studied hundreds of campaigns over the last century. Indeed, historically, dictatorships are rarely overthrown from the outside. They fall when their own people turn on them. Dictators fear their own people more than any foreign enemy. That is why for a dictator, the appearance of popularity is extremely important. You see, every dissident in a dictatorship faces a hard choice between speaking out and risk being arrested or silently going about their life in the hopes that someday the opposition will gain enough momentum to reach a tipping point, which they could then join. What they don't know is that the tipping point might already be passed. Unpopular dictators survive simply because people do not realize how unpopular they really are. And to that end, dictators work hard to manipulate the public's perception of their popularity. For example, by bussing in supporters to rallies. Giving speeches to an empty square would be a sign of unpopularity, and the dictator wants dissidents to feel isolated in their views. But this sort of scheme can backfire. In December of 1989, amid growing unrest, Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceaușescu had trains loaded with factory workers who were thought to be regime supporters brought in in an attempt to repress mass protests. Busloads of workers, under the threat of being fired upon, arrived at the square and were given flags, banners and large pictures of the dictator. Ceausescu was set to give a speech there and party officials went to great lengths to make it appear that he was still popular. But, after a brief confrontation, the workers who were brought in ended up joining the protest. When Ceausescu started his speech, he was convinced he was addressing a crowd of loyalists. But just a minute into the speech, people began booing and shouting against him. In a country where dissent had been crushed for years, this was unprecedented. Ceausescu was visibly stunned by the crowd's reaction. He tried to calm the crowd by announcing social benefits and raising minimum wages. However, it was too little, too late. Moreover, this was all being broadcast live on national television, and images of Ceausescu's confused facial expression as the crowd began to boo and heckle him before he lost control were seen by people across Romania. The state television quickly cut off the live broadcast, however, by that point, the damage had been done. The myth of the regime's popularity had cracked for the first time, and Romanians understood that the dictator was not invincible. The army turned on him the next day, and within a week, he was tried and executed. Now, what on earth does this have to do with online trolls? You see, to hold a rally in front of a hundred thousand people, you need a hundred thousand actual people. And a hundred thousand people are difficult to control. But in the information age, a hundred thousand online supporters can easily be faked. And according to Sophie Zhang, social media manipulation is the successor to that legacy of bossing people in. She is a data analyst turned whistleblower at Facebook who exposed widespread political manipulation across 25 countries, the most egregious of which she says came from Azerbaijan. One of the worst examples of this was in the former Soviet nation of Azerbaijan. Here's a Facebook post about activists being sent to prison for criticizing Azerbaijani politicians. It has more than a thousand comments on it supporting the Azerbaijani government. 
But if you look closelier at who is leaving these comments, you'll see that it's not a user account, but a Facebook page for a coffee shop that's been given a name and a photo to look like a real person. And the coffee shop page had been created two weeks before commenting on the post. You see, Facebook does not allow users to make multiple accounts. But there are no restrictions for a single user to create multiple pages, usually meant for businesses, and then giving them names and photos to disguise them as real people. Using this technique, a single troll can mass manufacture dozens of pages to look like real people, go through them one by one, leaving hundreds of comments that look like they're coming from actual different people. Out of the 301 comments that The Guardian analyzed on this post, 294 were made by pages disguised as people. Indeed, this was the exact same loophole used by Russian troll networks to sow division during the 2016 US election. According to the Facebook whistleblower Sophie Zhang, the Azerbaijani troll network coordinated their activity via Facebook messaging groups with names such as First Shift, Second Shift, etc. And the comments were almost exclusively made on weekdays between 9 in the morning and 6 in the afternoon with an hour break around lunch. And since these comments show intimate knowledge of Azerbaijani politics, the assumption is that they are written by actual Azerbaijani people. In October of 2020, Facebook announced the removal of more than 8,000 Facebook and Instagram pages or accounts linked to the Azerbaijan's ruling party for violating its policy against what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior. But shortly after the Facebook announcement, a review of the operation's most common targets found that the trolling operation had returned. And it's safe to assume similar techniques are being used on other social media platforms where one device can control multiple accounts to inflate numbers. Unlike Ceausescu's fake supporters, Aliyev's trolls can't turn on him. That's the appeal of having an online troll network. If one person decides to turn against him, they'll simply be out of a job. But similar to the bust in supporters, this online operation targets were the most prominent critics of the ruling regime. Aliyev's trolls comments focused on repeatedly highlighting how great the government was and how terrible the opposition was. You may have expected the Azerbaijani troll network to be primarily targeting Armenia, but they were not. They were mainly focused on harassing the domestic opposition, which tells us that Aliyev fears his own people more than any foreign threat. To reiterate, dictators are rarely overthrown from the outside. They fall when their people turn on them, and Aliyev seems to understand this well. But that doesn't mean that Azerbaijan's trolls have never been deployed internationally. After a failed Azerbaijani military operation in 2017, fake profiles with Armenian names were spreading disinformation on Facebook. One post said, We have a lot of casualties. Hospitals are full. Each second soldier has lost a hand or a foot. This type of psychological warfare is aimed at creating mass panic in the public, but you can imagine what kind of a demoralizing effect it can also have on a soldier on the ground. Western journalists covering Azerbaijan's atrocities have also long been a target. I covered one such case in this video, link in the description. When Zhang brought the issue to Facebook, she was informed that the company would prioritize investigating operations in the US, Western Europe and foreign adversaries such as Russia, Iran, etc. As such, inauthentic activity from some countries was addressed within days, while other countries like Azerbaijan, they were ignored despite being the most egregious offender. More recently, I started noticing something suspicious on the Armenian subreddit. You see, when signing up for a new Reddit account, you have the option to generate a random username. Don't ask how I know this. The randomly generated usernames are always two random words followed by up to four random digits. Once you know this, they stick out like a sore thumb. 
I have to quickly mention though, not all trolls use randomly generated names and users with randomly generated names are not necessarily trolls. There are many legitimate users who generated their usernames this way and conversely, sophisticated trolls who use names that blend in. I will talk more about how to actually identify and respond to trolls later in the video. But let's get back to the story. One day, a couple of months ago, I noticed a sudden surge of comments from such usernames on the Armenian subreddit. So I started clicking on their names and noticed most of them were one day old accounts. When I pointed this out, they began to verbally harass me. One time, another one day old account showed up and joined them. Then they deleted their comments and accounts. Now, there's no way to tell who was behind this particular operation, but based on the recent surge of Russian propaganda in Armenia, my hunch is that this was part of a Russian operation aimed at destabilizing Armenia. For one, the Facebook announcement from 2020 had also found 224 Russian accounts who were targeting Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, among others. Furthermore, some of the suspicious accounts from the Armenian subreddit were also active in Russia-Ukraine war related subreddits. But I don't want to get sidetracked, it's just a hunch and frankly who is behind the attack doesn't matter right now. I want to focus on how trolls operate and what we can do to mitigate their effect. So, what were the reddit trolls commenting before being called out and deleting everything? Well, not much. Most of the time they would go about commenting on posts like regular accounts to try and blend in and gradually prop up their account metrics. Most of the time they ended up exposed and purged. But every now and then they did participate in hot button topics taking clear sides. I saw some pro-Russian posts, but also some pro-Western posts. But wait! Hold on a second. Didn't I just say I suspected this to be a Russian operation? Yes, and if you're wondering how that makes any sense, then you're not thinking like a troll. You see, in the context of information warfare, a troll's main objective is different than that of propaganda. Propaganda, like the Russian propaganda that I covered in the last video, pushes specific narratives to manipulate public perception towards a certain goal. Trolls, on the other hand, when deployed internationally against an adversary, are focused on sowing discord. This is NATO's Strategic Communications Center of Excellence's quarterly publication titled Robotrolling. The authors of this issue analyzed 16,000 reddit posts to compare conversations connected to a Russian troll farm to organic conversations. They measured conversation quality in three metrics, cognitive complexity, identity attacks, and toxicity. A high cognitive complexity simply means a more nuanced conversation, whereas a low cognitive complexity reflects a two-sided echo chamber. Whenever a topic is being discussed, these metrics are usually constant around a baseline value, until a single comment was injected into the discussion by a troll account, and it derailed the entire conversation. When comparing to the gray line, which represents discussions that did not include a troll comment, a single comment by a troll was enough to cause a spike in identity attacks. It also increased the toxicity while reducing the cognitive complexity for the remainder of the conversation. That's what the trolls want. If they can make a conversation a two-sided thing rather than a multiple-sided thing, everything becomes either black or white, people get locked into their narratives and they become much easier to control. That's why state-sponsored trolls take both sides of the same argument. It's less about what they're saying and more about how they're saying it. They don't care about the argument, they just want to cause chaos. I'd like to clarify that trolls aren't bots. You've probably noticed under any hot button topic on social media, a slew of repetitive comments, usually vague enough to apply to a wide range of content, or thousands upon thousands of the exact same post, usually a hashtag or a slogan over and over again. Here's one example of that I recorded on Twitter or X. This is Azerbaijan's bot network trying to flood the hashtag COP29, the hashtag associated with a climate summit being hosted in 
Azerbaijan, which has drawn widespread criticism as a blatant attempt to greenwash its regime's image. But these are obviously not real people, they are bots, usually hundreds of phones being controlled by a single computer. While bots are also a part of coordinated inauthentic behavior, they are usually not as effective, which is why in some countries like Russia, China, Turkey, Azerbaijan, the operations are more sophisticated. In combination with the bots, they have real people sitting at desks writing out hundreds of thousands of fake comments. As you can imagine, these human trolls are a lot more dangerous than bots. They are able to adapt and convincingly interact with real users. And to make matters worse, with the rise of large language models like ChatGPT, we've already started to see bots get upgraded to become more sophisticated and mimic trolls. In the coming years, I anticipate these AI-driven bots to completely overwhelm online conversations by spewing vitriol in massive numbers and causing chaos even more effectively than human trolls. But I don't want to sound too alarming. Many system-wide solutions are being discussed, from requiring user verification for public posts to implementing advanced AI detection algorithms. I do believe regimes like Azerbaijan are not treated as seriously as they should be by platforms like Facebook, but until then, I want to end with some practical advice. First, what you don't want to do is become paranoid and irrationally start seeing trolls everywhere or anytime anybody disagrees with you. In his excellent video about this topic, Destin puts it excellently when he says, The troll's first play is to make you hate your online brother. The troll's second play is to make you think your online brother is a troll. So, if you react impulsively, you'd be behaving like a troll and serving their purpose. And the troll wins. But the troll also wins when real people like you disengage from the conversation entirely, allowing the trolls to take complete control of the narrative. But then, how should we A. Identify trolls and B. Respond to them? Here's what's been working for me. If a person online is being provocative and riling you up, take a second to assess before responding. Remember the graphs we discussed earlier. Is the person reducing the cognitive complexity of the conversation to two polarized sides? Is the person being toxic or engaging in identity attacks? Those are some signs that you are being trolled and you can ignore it, or better yet, report it to the platform. Most platforms have rules against harassment. But if you're not sure and you do decide to respond, try to engage your analytical system and respond with what you are thinking and not how you are feeling. Try to de-escalate and bring the quality of the conversation back up by adding perspective and remember to do it with kindness and respect. That's what the trolls hate the most because the real battle is happening inside you.